I'm just going to give you a few, um, just an outline of the evening, uh, just to give you a sense of, of, um, of, of, of the program. Um, I love it when people read from their own books. Um, so I've asked Azra to read from her own book. And I also particularly like it when they don't tell you what parts they're going to read uh, from the book, because it's a surprise and uh, generates new ideas and new questions. Um, I also obviously have been interviewed myself several times, but um, also don't I don't share questions beforehand, and often don't even make questions beforehand. I, I like to have a real conversation. So um, so what we'll do is I'll have Azra read, I've asked her to read two passages from the book, I don't know what those passages are, um, and then start from there, start the conversation from there. We will then talk, um, obviously the book has raised a, a lot of questions in for me, but also a lot of questions for um, the cancer community and for the world at large, um, and I want it to be. I want to have a provocative conversation around those topics. Um, then we will, um, after about I would say about an hour or so, um, we will break for questions. Um, and at the end of the questions, we'd like to finish with a video made by the sister of a patient. Um, I will introduce the video before we make it. But there'll be nothing else after that. That video is 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 the is is the last piece in some ways, and you when you see it, you'll you'll see and understand why. I will introduce the video before uh, that, um, and then we'll end the evening. Um, so that's going to be the format. So Azra, why don't we start off with you uh, reading a little bit about uh, from the book, give an introduction, and also welcome to whoever you want to welcome. Um, I, I maybe the first maybe one thought that comes to mind is that. There's not one book in this book. There are many books. Um, there is a, uh, a book that's a cry from the heart. Uh, there is a book that is, uh, uh, that is uh, written by someone who's been personally affected, wounded uh, by cancer. There is a book about policy. There is a book about politics. There is a book about uh, polemics. Uh, there's a book, there's a, it's an argument, um, and also it's a, it's a biography, it's an autobiography. So um, there are stories of individuals, but then those stories of individuals become a mechanisms of, uh, or, or ways to think about where we are in this journey and what the landscape looks like. So it is not one book, but many books, like all great books are. Um, so I will eventually, I will try to break apart all these different strands, these many books that are condensed in, in, in one book. Um, but let me, let's begin with, with you and your, and your chosen passages. Thank you, Sid. And uh, thank you to Pioneer Works. Thank you to Meredith and Jenna and Dustin. And uh, most of all, thank you to Sid who is a wonderful colleague, and uh, I can't imagine a better interlocutor uh, for myself than Siddharth, because uh, we share a lab, we do so many things together, and the hope this evening is that we'll have a conversation and Sid will contribute equally. Today is an interesting day to have this uh, conversation, especially because uh, uh, I read this article that came out by the director of the National Institute of Health in Time magazine, Dr. Francis Collins. Uh, those of you who don't know, Dr. Collins uh, is the one who led the group which uh, from the side of the government to sequence the first human genome. I can't think of a bigger project than that, and he was a leader from the government side. Craig Venter did the private, uh, privately funded genome sequencing. And in this special issue of Time magazine, which is devoted to innovation in health, um, Dr. Francis Collins has described his vision for the future of um, the state of health and what we are planning to do. And one of the things he points out in the very first paragraph 
is that something that the nation can be proud of is the fact that there is a drop in mortality from heart disease by 70%. But in the same sentence, he also says, and also mortality from cancer is dropping by 1% a year. And that's a very staggering statistic. 70% versus 1%. So I thought I'll read a relevant passage about that. Which is actually the epilogue of the book. So I'll read just a couple of uh, pages from it. My older sister Amra, my brother Tasneem, and I took my mother shopping in Buffalo one sunny summer afternoon when she was visiting from Karachi. Tasneem, a cardiac surgeon at Buffalo General Hospital, had already performed hundreds of coronary bypass surgeries, and his group was leading the charge in heart transplant in western New York. It was impossible to walk 50 feet in the mall without being stopped by one of his cured patients, pumping his hand enthusiastically, beaming at our mother, awash in gratitude because her son had heroically saved their lives. Of course, at home, Tasneem was less eulogized. We siblings refusing to let him develop the God complex of heart surgeons. We teased him mercilessly at family gatherings. My sister Sora would innocently ask, Aps, what do you call two cardiac surgeons looking at an EKG? I would reply, deadpan, a double blind study. <laughs> Thankfully, no one likes a joke better than Tasneem, who would gleefully address the pediatrician, my sister Atya, the radiologist, my sister Sora, and oncologist, me. Statistically speaking, ladies, nine out of 10 injections you give are in vain. <laughs> he also loved calling us by an acronym, which we reserved for our ex-boyfriends. Hello sisters, what is the NATO group up to this evening? NATO being our code word for no action, talk only. Or he would ask us sweetly if we had heard of the mechanic working on the heart surgeon's motorbike who said, so dog, look at this engine. I open it, it's heart. I take the valves out, I repair the damage and put them back in. And when I finish, it works just like new. So how come I make 40,000 a year and you get 40,000 a month? The surgeon replied smugly, try doing it with the engine running. As we were returning home, my mother asked the question I had been dreading. Well, you've been in Buffalo for almost 10 years. I've never met any of your patients. Why are heart patients doing so much better? She had put her finger on the heart of the matter. The Sneem and I often had the same conversation. Our conclusion? Heart doctors recognized that the only effective treatment was prevention and early intervention. The equivalent of cancer in heart disease would be a heart so severely damaged that the only possible treatment would be a transplant. Advanced cancer is like this end stage heart disease where only extreme heroic measures have the potential for saving lives. So why don't you find ways to diagnose cancer early also, my mother asked. She was pleased to hear that devoting my life to understanding and treating MDS, the pre-leukemic condition, was my attempt to do precisely that, catch the leukemia early. Well, I'm glad you're living in America then, she said you will have an easier time convincing your colleagues to alter their attitudes. In Pakistan, the system would be impossible to change in one lifetime. Second passage, or would you like to stop? Yeah, I can read the second passage. 
So the point I'm making is exactly the point that is raised by Dr. Francis Collins in Time magazine today, that heart disease mortality has dropped by 70% because they catch it early and fix the coronaries. So, well, now you understand the title of this book. But as Sid said, this book is also a kind of a personal story. Although it has taken me 18 years since my late husband's death to actually be able to even verbalize some of it. So I'll just read the prologue. So I read you the ep part of the epilogue, and I'll now go to the prologue, and then we can have a conversation. You can read the middle. <laughs> or you could hear the middle, because my daughter, Shahrzad has actually recorded the audio book. And uh, even no bias, I think she did a good job. <laughs> So the prologue is, uh, is, is just brief, I'll read it. In the early spring of 1998, my husband, Harvey Preissler, was diagnosed with cancer. Uh, just to give you an idea, Harvey was head of the cancer center at the university. The following year, we planned to take our five-year-old daughter, Shahrzad, and my brother Javed's two children visiting from Pakistan, Musa and Batul, eight and 12, to San Francisco for a highly anticipated vacation. We had already postponed the trip twice before it could be, but it could be delayed no longer. The children were eager, and given Harvey's disfiguring facial edema and the enlarging node, some form of aggressive treatment, sure to require us to stay put in the city for months, was now imminent. Before any of that happened, he felt strongly that the family needed to get out of the sweltering heat of Chicago for a vacation, even if just for a week. Our flight to San Francisco was on a bright, clear summer morning. Having arrived at the gate a good 90 minutes before our departure, we split up. Harvey sat down in the boarding area while I chased the children around O'Hare. We got something to eat at the food court and then returned to the gate. I was shocked by what I saw. Harvey sat looking dazed as streams of sweat poured from his body, making little puddles under his elbows, on the armrests of the chair, and under his knees on the floor. He was beet red. Tributaries of glistening perspiration filled the lines in his handsome face, making it appear startlingly young. He looked at me with hushed anxiety. I sent Batul running for the nearest cafe to get me a handful of napkins. I dabbed Harvey's face and arms, wiping the chair and the floor. There was no respite. The sweat came in torrential waves. His t-shirt and shorts were entirely soaked and dripping. The children stood around trying not to look, their faces ashen. It was a good 15 minutes before the deluge subsided. I walked to the gift shop and purchased a fresh pair of pants and shirt. Without saying a word, little eight-year-old Musa stepped forward, quietly took the passage, package from me, and gently escorted a bewildered Harvey to the restroom. Being oncologists, both Harvey and I understood precisely what the sweating meant. Known as a B symptom, it's a well-recognized manifestation of many cancers, especially lymphomas and it's not a good sign. B symptoms are associated with a more advanced, more aggressive disease with a poorer prognosis. I suggested we cancel the trip and return home, but Harvey, not willing to disappoint the children, yet again insisted on going ahead. The first 24 hours in San Francisco were filled with apprehension as we drove the children around the crooked street and the harbor, not knowing what to expect, fearing the worst. Nothing much happened. Harvey began to relax. Then in the middle of the third night, I woke up with a start. Water dripped steadily on my face. Harvey's arm was arched over my head and running like a faucet. This time, we not only had to change his clothing, we had to call housekeeping to replace the soaking wet sheets. 
By the time we returned to O'Hare a week later, Harvey had developed another bizarre syndrome associated with many cancers. His left wrist suddenly blew up to twice its normal size. Despite the extra strength Tylenol I gave him, he was writhing in agony as we climbed into the car to go home. It took 24 hours of cold packs and heavy duty analgesics to control the excruciating pain. The next few days were some of the most tormented. He experienced regular episodes of drenching sweats once or sometimes twice during the night, requiring fresh bed, se bed sheets and clothing changes. As swelling subsided in one joint, it popped up elsewhere without warning. Fresh lesions began with a tingling, burning sensation becoming bright red and sizzling hot within hours. Nomadic lymphoma cells meandered autonomously, rudderless. Edema regressed from the face only to reappear in the joints. Lymph nodes in the neck and armpits swelled one day and receded the next, followed by a sudden enlargement of the spleen. Itinerant cells segregated, dispersed, recollected, vanished, regrouped. They wandered the body with a studied carelessness, entering and leaving organs at will, disgruntled, edgy, exploring possible niches in various organs, rejecting some, settling in others. Horrified, helpless, we watched the drama unfold. Harvey from the inside, I from the outside. The lymphoma marched on its aimless, monomaniacal journey into irresolution with a motiveless malignity. Cancer is what I had been treating for two decades. Yet, until I shared a bed with a cancer patient, I had no idea how unbearably painful a disease it could be. It was the summer of our discontent, cancer and its discontents. Um, I thought I would begin uh, my questions by uh, reminding people of a, um, an incredible passage from Lewis Thomas's book um, when he was an intern in the 1940s. Um, Thomas describes how patients with heart disease, this is very relevant to what you just said, Thomas describes how patients with heart disease were treated in the 1950s. So basically, if you had coronary disease, uh, if you had a heart attack um, in the 40s and 50s, um, the options were that you would be brought to the hospital and be put underneath an oxygen tent um, to, to, to give you oxygen. Um, and then really among the only things that one could do was to give you morphine to ease the pain. Um, and then, and usually, an intern had to draw, uh, draw out a couple of pints of blood um, every few hours. And this was thought to relieve the, um, the uh, pressure on, on the heart and thereby ease the uh, symptoms. So not long ago, not 50, you know, 40, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, um, there was a moment if you sat down in this audience, you could say that, and I would say, well, what's your vision for, for the future of coronary disease, such a huge killer? And you'd say, well, this is the future. The future is that you know, we'll make better oxygen tents, uh, we'll make larger um, syringes to draw out blood, um, we will have more powerful versions of morphine, um, and that, that, that would be the vision. Um, and, of course, that would be laughable today, right? Uh, what we have instead is biomarkers for early detection of heart disease. Um, many of you know about them, cholesterol being one of them. Um, family histories that are being used to find patients who are at higher risk. Um, uh, physical signs and symptoms to identify patients who are at risk before they actually develop the risk hypertension being one of them, uh, 
behavioral modification, uh, smoking cessation being the, probably the most important of those, um, and then prophylactic medicines, aspirin and medicines to reduce cholesterol. And finally, after all of this, uh, surgical intervention and other interventions too. So um, hopefully in 20 years or 30 years from now, we will also be laughing um, grimly about the idea of using cell-killing poisons, which is most of chemotherapy, to treat cancer uh, in the same way that we'd be laughing at or smiling, again, grimly, at the intern who had to, for every two hours, withdraw two pints of blood from a patient with, with coronary disease. Um, the, one of the most important passages that comes out of this Lewis Thomas um, observation is that is a passage that he quotes from, from, from Osler, from William Osler, the great physician, physician scientist, who basically uh, advised his students to first understand the disease and to understand the disease and do nothing. Um, this idea was called therapeutic nihilism. Um, it was not first do no harm, it was first do nothing. Um, because you don't know anything, first watch, first understand. Because doing things actually can give you the false confidence that you're, you're actually doing something. But observing, making observations, recording, understanding, um, actually defeats that, that uh, arrogance and reverses, to some extent, our capacity to understand a disease. You, you now approach the disease with humility rather than, than, than passion. So this idea of therapeutic nihilism uh, was very, became a very important catchstone in medicine. So I'm sorry for the long prologue to this question, but um, walk us 20 years from now, Azra, and Imagine for us a world in, which is different and imagine the journey of, of maybe a pre-cancer patient or a patient without um, overt cancer and tell us how we will be smiling grimly 20 years from now. Well, I think the points you have made are very relevant because uh, it just brought to my mind a quotation from Einstein who said that if I was given one hour to solve a problem, I would spend 55 minutes trying to define the problem and five minutes for the solution. One of the main reasons why I wrote this book is because I was inspired by the patient young Andrew, 22 year old, my daughter's best friend who gets diagnosed with a brain tumor but the idea is to bring the patient back front and center into every conversation. To make a distinction between disease and illness. Disease is what doctors diagnose and treat, but illness is what patients experience. And so why not look at every single thing through the prism of human anguish? because we have moved too far away. We are so obsessed with trying to find a cure that we have forgotten about healing. I think 20 years from now, one of the most important things we will think about is that it's not that we didn't just have a solution of cancer, but we were not willing to even define the problem and face it clearly. So what is the well, the problem is that for any patient with advanced cancer today, if it is not detected early and is not treatable by the slash poison burn approach, then the outlook and response to treatment is no better than it was 50 years ago. Certainly, we are curing 68% of the patients who are diagnosed today. 
curing 68%, that's a wonderful number, but curing with what? These really stone age kinds of treatments. Chemotherapy, this, these were things used in the world war to kill your enemy. I mean, in this day and age of uh, sophisticated technology where we are proudly claiming to be cutting and pasting DNA, why are we using these paleolithic measures? But still 68% patients live through it all and are cured. What about the 32% for whom we are offering nothing? This is one of the problems. And not only are they physically suffering, a study just came out that looked at nine and a half million cancer patients diagnosed in America over a, 20, a 12 year period recently. And 42% patients diagnosed with cancer, 42% lose every penny of their life savings by two plus years and become completely financially ruined without being cured. This, I mean, what could be a bigger problem than this? First of all, we seem to be giving an impression to the public that a lot has changed. Yes, a lot of patients are being cured and there is a drop into cancer mortality and death rate by 26% in the last 50 years. But most of it is because of anti-smoking campaigns or early detection of cancer because of screening measures. What screening measures? Very gross ones. Mammography, colonoscopy, putting a tube into the gut and looking. I mean, really, in this day and age, that's the best we can do? PSA and pap smear, these are the four methods. And people keep asking me, oh, those methods haven't been perfect. You know, they can overdiagnose, lead to over. I mean, for God's sake, we need to use the current technology to detect cancer early and prevent it. So the problem that I want to define very clearly is that we have to question what we are doing today. And we need to stop painting some glowing picture as if the magic cure is right around the corner. So, so, so come, go back a little bit to the title of the book and talk about the, the, the first cell. Um, one of the, I think, the, one of the wisest uh, minds in cancer, widely acknowledged as one of the wisest minds in cancer, is, of course, Bert Vogelstein. Um, the, pro the problem with Bert is that he, he um, um, is, a, is a very close friend, but he won't sit on airplanes. He has a pathological fear of airplanes. And so you can't meet him except to go to him, uh, go to his office. Once, when he wins extremely large, very, very substantial awards, including the Lasker and other prizes, he's won many, um, he will travel, but only under those circumstances. But Bert, um, Bert Vogelstein is a very important figure in, in cancer because he has many discoveries, too many to name. But of course, one very important discovery that Bert made early on in his life was to show that cancer doesn't just suddenly appear one day out of the head of Zeus. A cell doesn't wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to become a cancer cell. It undergoes a series of mutational events. Um, it, it might undergo as, as many as 10, 15, 20, 30 changes. Um, their breast, cancers, uh, their breast cancers, where their cells have acquired 100 mutational events. And there are certainly other cancers that cells have acquired hundreds of mutational events. And so rather than, um, uh, as I said, waking up one morning and becoming a cancer cells, cells slouch towards cancer. Um, and Bert discovered this. Uh, by defining these events. He discovered the, he defined the mutational events. Um, and what's fascinating about the, from there is that having done so, he began to focus very much on prevention, on finding the cell before it had acquired all its final mutations. So tell us about, about, about this idea of the first cell and tell us about why one might be able to find it. Um, 
tell us about how you imagine finding, um, finding the first cell and why it's important. Yeah, in fact, I'm a big, uh, of course, everybody's a big admirer and of Bert Vogelstein, and he's one of the most respectable figures, and I'm so glad that he has gotten all, gone through the whole sequence of events that you described and is dedicating his life to now early detection also. And uh, uh, they have this cancer seek, as you know, coming out and very exciting work coming from him. Um, for me, the questions really began back in 1984. I came to this country as a young uh, medical graduate in 1977. I got involved immediately, starting to study acute myeloid leukemia first, and then did my residency training, and then continued my uh, treatment of patients, as well as studying the disease in the lab. And to this day, I see 30 to 40 patients every week, and I, ha I supervise a very active research lab. Um, and of course, I'm a cancer widow, as you just heard. Uh, and for me, it became very clear within six or seven years of starting to treat leukemia that this is far too complicated, aggressive, and malignant a disease for us to control in my lifetime, at least. So I pinned my hopes on trying to prevent it from happening. And indeed, I was seeing many, many patients who would give me a history that before they developed acute leukemia and came to see me, their counts had been dropping or they had developed anemia a couple of years before. And that piqued my interest immediately about what was that stage, pre-leukemic stage. And back uh, in 1984, because of an experience with a patient, JC, who forms chapter five of this book, I became obsessed with studying the disease earlier than leukemia with the hope that we could prevent it from, uh, from happening. And the idea was literally this first cell idea back in 1984. So Bert Vogelstein has defined these stages very carefully for colorectal cancers, but these neat little stages don't always occur in every kind of cancer, for example. Uh, breast cancer doesn't progress like that. Prostate cancer doesn't go through all these neat stages. Um, and in fact, pre-leukemia, which is known as myelodysplastic syndromes, these are also very heterogeneous kind of diseases in which some patients will develop leukemia out of the blue within a few months, and others I have been treating for 25 years and still are doing fine and leading good qualities of life. So it's not that easy to predict. In other words, in order to define the natural history of a disease, we can't use statistics and apply them to individuals. We basically have to look at every individual as a person and try to see how their disease is going to behave, not how 60% of patients behaved in another large study. So I realized several things earlier on. One, it's better to prevent than to allow the disease to reach an, this end stage monstrosity, which is an, not controllable easily. And two, in order to do that, we should really try to study what are the footprints of this early uh, evolution. And so I started saving samples on my patients from blood and bone marrow back in 1984 for this express reason to try and define and identify how the first leukemia cell appears in a pre-leukemia patient. And can we find it and can we kill it? One of the best things, uh, even if we find the first cell, how do you kill one cell in the body? And you will be surprised to know that so many sophisticated technologies have already been developed to identify one cell. Why? Because once we treat a cancer patient with all kinds of aggressive therapies, we are still concerned that there may be something left over. So we have developed all this fancy technology to detect the residual cancer cells, the last minimal disease that's left behind. My point is, why not just reverse it instead of minimal residual disease, go for minimal initial disease? 
Well, that poses a problem because to look for minimal residual disease or the last cancer cell, we know which individuals to look in. in patients who have been treated for cancer, we can then look in their blood or marrow or saliva or tears or uh, urine, anything for the presence of cancer in any form. But how do you look for the first cell? Who should you look at even? Should you be looking at everybody? Is anyone immune from cancer? No. But the idea is that by studying and identifying the earliest footprints of, say, leukemia, the earliest footprints of prostate cancer, earliest footprints of breast cancer, once we have those markers, we can even have a chip that has a barcode of all these markers that you can drop one drop of blood and the chip detects which one in once a month. Why do we have to do screening by using age-old technologies once a year? No, I'm saying we should be monitoring the human body continuously for the appearance of disease-caused perturbations earlier on. And I think the concept of the first cell is not new. Everyone wants to do it. Everyone wants to detect it. But I don't think that enough uh, resources have been devoted towards this because we are dealing with active patients all the time. And most of the resources are going to try and treat the last cancer cell, which is not, I'm not against it at all. I treat patients all the time myself, so of course that's important. But I do think that we have two sets of problems, one for the present cancer patients and one for the future. I don't think anyone in this room is more than one degree of separation from cancer right now. Either you have cancer yourself or you know someone or you love someone who has had cancer. This is how prevalent it is. So it's a very real question for all of us. What to do with patients who have cancer now? I think number one is the rule in medicine is first do no harm. And I'm asking that the best of therapies we are developing right now help only a fraction of patients. 20% patients are helped with a drug and we are proclaiming it from the rooftops as a game changer. 20% patients improved survival by five months at the cost of hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. We celebrate the 20%. Azra, that five months meant a lot to my patient. Of course it did, but what about the 80% who suffered physical toxicities as well as financial ruin why are we not thinking about them? Why are we ignoring that first rule of medicine, first do no harm? It's somehow the most visible has become invisible right now. We're just doing things because other people have decided for us. This is the algorithm you need to follow. If somebody is diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, this is first line therapy you're going to give, this is second line therapy, third line, and then send them to hospice. And no one is questioning it. If I, if I don't do it, I'll be in jail. Because this is what's suggested by the oncologist. So, what? Do you think that there will be some cancers? I mean, cancer is a very heterogeneous disease, obviously. Um, uh, some cancers, as it turns out, um, finding not the first cell, but certainly finding an early cell, um, has made a huge difference. Um, so two examples stand out uh, in this. Um, one of them is, a, is an international, is really a, is an international success and that is uh, the detection of cervical cancer through pap smearing, um, really invented 20 miles from here by George Papanicolaou. Um, actually, if you've never done it, you can actually go in Papanicolaou's uh, microscope and his slides are still, you can see them. Oh, really? Yeah, up at Cornell. I went, 
uh, in a tiny room, it's actually virtually impossible to find, hidden away in the Wild Cornell Hospital is Papa Nicolau's original lab where he, and, and, and all his slides are there. Wow. I mean, he, he, you can actually look at the first pap smear slides. Anyway, um, that's one example. And the second, of course, example is colon cancer, where you can find um, uh, early lesions uh, through colonoscopy, gross as it might be, I don't mean physically gross, as, but, but as a, as a, as a not, not sophisticated way, but certainly you can find them. And in both cases, uh, we've seen mortality drop. We've seen public uh, figures that, that in fact there's a drop in mortality. Is it possible that some cancers will be much more amenable to finding the first cell, while other cancers will be very, very hard to find first cells, much like, as I said, the pap smear and the and the and, and colonoscopy um, uh, revolutionized those two fields, or, or do you think that that we will eventually uh, find first fingerprints, first footprints of most cancers, if not all cancers? Is there yeah. is there something about the cancer that, that that's relevant here? Well, treating cancer as one disease is like treating Africa as one country. It is so different in within the same individual, in two places, cancer is completely different. Uh, cancer of the colon, when it metastasizes to the liver, the liver metastasis is totally different soil. The seed changes to adapt itself to the soil. Very different cancer. So, of course, what you have said is exactly right, that some cancers will be easily um, followed up. Uh, and for the detection of the first cell. Others will, will really challenge our, uh, our wits uh, to the end and will be harder to detect. But hey, I mean, if we can start, I mean, you, just the statistics are so mind boggling right now. I want to give everybody some pause to think about this. In the last 50 years, the only things we have done some exceptions, rare exceptions, and um, uncommon cancers. Uh, Dr. Kanti Rai is sitting in the room, the original Rai classification. Uh, what an honor it is to have him here. I mean, he has changed, uh, he has seen a sea change in the disease he's uh, treating, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, we'll talk about lymphoma. That a bit. Because, I mean, this is, as, as you point out, this is not just a doom and gloom book. Right? No, of course not. So, so there are, uh, you, you know, Kanti, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded, um, I, 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 was, uh, I was chairing a symposium on ovarian cancer yesterday because we were, ma we were making um, real ovarian organoids from patients. We're taking actual cancers, growing them in dishes, which we couldn't do before. One of the great peculiar ironies of cancer is that while it grows with, with such malignant fealty in the body, if you take it out of the body, they're actually hard to grow. Um, we now know why. There are actually very specific reasons why. Um, they depend very much on the microenvironment. They depend where they, they eat things. But uh, just to give a sense of, of, of um, some of the changes, um, uh, the, the disease, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, actually not an uncommon cancer, um, has seen a complete sea change. Complete sea change. Um, yeah. Myeloma. Um, if you walked into, um, if you had multiple myeloma, uh, there's a there's a there's a lovely study from the Mayo Clinic. Um, it's very hard to. It's very very difficult, as you know, to um, understand progress in a disease because you can be fooled by survival statistics. Um, I've written extensively about this. Survival statistics are very, 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 very poor uh, mechanisms to understand progress on, of a disease because they are very biased. Because if you detect things early, you move the survival statistic, but you actually haven't changed the disease. In other words, it's, it's, it's a bias. It's a lead bias. It's a very common bias. So people say, gosh, you know, five-year survival from breast cancer has increased by 50%. But that's all, that's mainly, not only, but mainly because we're detecting earlier cancers. And by detecting earlier cancers, it, it, you, you falsely figure out that five-year survival has increased. But in some diseases, um, when you can do real studies, 
if you were a patient with myeloma and walked into a myeloma clinic in 1993, um, your chances of being alive at six to eight months was, um, I don't know what number would be, 20%, say. Uh, that num number has doubled, if not tripled. Uh, and now if you walk in, the same patient walks in today, that number has, has tripled. So um, tell us about how you imagine, if you were given the, the reins of the, of the National Cancer Institute, what, 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 would, what, would, what, 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 what three things you, would you do to make uh, substantial differences in the lives of, of, of patients with cancer? How would you change the, the national cancer agenda? I mean, I think the most important thing is, as I said, is to bring the patient back front and center. We need to study the patient. We need to, to really determine the disease in vivo in humans. People keep telling me, oh, you can't do tests in humans, then don't do them. Find something else to do in humans that you can detect. You can detect biomarkers. You can develop uh, means to find cell-free DNA that cells shed. Uh, so the three things I would do, number one, bring the patient back front and center to study human tissue. Get away at least for drug development and treatment. Animal models are very good as biologic tools, but they are no good as um, means of developing drugs. You can't treat a rabbit or a mouse with a drug and say the same thing will happen in humans. It won't. But people seem to think I'm against all animal models. No, I'm not. But I am against uh, drug development in animals. So study humans, uh, do the clinical trials properly, and at least half the resources devoted towards research should go towards prevention. Screening through the latest technology. Let me describe a couple of things to you. For example, when a cancer begins, the cells divide faster than normal cells. So they need to attract nutrition for fast proliferation which means they start making blood vessels, which means the area becomes hot. Tomorrow's technology will be that you go to sleep in bed sheets that are scanning you overnight for the appearance of a hot spot. You sit on a fit loo in the morning that takes part of your urine and looks for biomarkers on a daily basis. You breathe into a device that measures molecules that are being discharged from lung cancers. You literally, as women, wear a smart bra for two hours a week. And the bra is equipped with 200 sensors that are detecting changes in temperature and blood flow. Two hours a week instead of once a year mammogram. Think of the difference I'm talking about. These are the technologies we need to develop. Why aren't we looking for the footprints of cancer in the forms of protein that are, proteins that are shed into the saliva or the blood? These are called liquid biopsies. So uh, patient, study the patient, spend at least half the money in prevention. But we must continue also for the sake of our current patients to keep investing at least half the money in developing treatments as well. But my contention is that the same treatment, which is causing immense toxicity and very little benefit, today the failure rate of drugs brought to the bedside of a cancer patient is 95%. 95% drug trials fail in America right now in cancer. The 5% that succeed extend the survival by an average of 2.5 months for a fraction of the patients. What kind of obscenity is this? And it costs $100,000 a year for that treatment. So imagine that you have, uh, give you an example, Sid. You brought out multiple myeloma just now. On September 5th, I read an article in Stat News by Gail McIntyre. She reported that three well-controlled 
large trials were done in multiple myeloma using the latest immune therapy called checkpoint inhibitors. All three trials were negative. So Dr. Richard Pazder, this brilliant uh, director of the uh, Center for uh, Excellence in Oncology at the FDA, he commented on this study and first of all he asked the question, why did you need three large trials to show a negative result? And secondly, do you know these checkpoint inhibitors, PD-1 and PDL one inhibitors, in multiple myeloma I'm talking about? Secondly, do you know how many trials are going on in the country right now with PD-1, PDL one inhibitors? Not 100, not 500, not 1,000, not 15, 2,200 trials. This me too mentality. If a target is identified and a drug gets FDA approved, everybody and their grandmother wants to make another drug for the same target. Think of the creativity it is squashing because now you're not looking for new targets. So these changes have to be instituted. I think that our agencies are not performing their responsibility properly by not uh, uh, demanding at least that Anyone who's, who wants to do a clinical trial should have in place some measures to protect the patients who are not going to respond. At least in the first trial, we treat everybody the same. But in the follow-up trial, we should be able to distinguish between those who responded and those who didn't respond and compare their samples at every level using every technology available to us. We don't. Why not? So these are the changes that have to be instituted. We have to change the way we are doing things, but mostly what I'm saying is at least half the budget should go towards prevention and early detection by and developing the latest technology to do it, the other half to continue developing treatments. Well, we're up to the hour, so I think this is a... Let me add one more thing before we finish, though. <laughs> Two more things. One is this immune therapy with CAR T cells is very popular. Everyone's heard about it. So many, uh, Practically every patient who comes to see me in clinics it will ask me, why aren't you giving me CAR T therapy? Because this has been, and rightfully so, it is a game changer for some people. But do you know the premise of this treatment, what it is? The premise is that we have failed as scientists to find something that distinguishes a normal cell from a malignant cell perfectly. We can't find anything right now. So CAR T is you just take out the patient's own T cells and tell it to kill the entire organ, normal and abnormal cells together. So let's say that if there is a tumor in the liver, we can't tell which cell has, is the cancerous liver cell and which cell is the normal liver cell. So we kill the whole liver. This is what we are doing with CAR T. The only thing it's working on is uh, B, cell. B cells. We destroy every B cell in the patient's body, which means normal and abnormal, and then we can replace the B cell function with continuous infusions, monthly infusions of immunoglobulins. You can't do that to the liver. You can't destroy the liver and then give back monthly liver doses. So that's why CAR-T can't be, but it is so drastic a measure. And by killing every B cell in the body, imagine the kind of cytokine storms and the body's reaction is such that patients' lives are at stake. They are threatened. My question is the same treatment if we can, with the help of biomarkers, give the address to the T cells, then that will be directed much better and, treat, and, and killing a few million cells compared to hundreds of billions, the toxicity will be much, much lower. So with this in mind, this is why in 1984 I started to collect the samples that earlier detection will make the same treatments which are causing so much problem now by directing it properly. So the last thing I wanted to say was that this tissue repository is very important. Why? Because we have followed patients longitudinally as they progress in the natural history of their disease from pre-leukemia to until their death, whether they die of MDS or they die of acute leukemia. 
And the idea is to catch the appearance of the first leukemia cell. And we are working with Dr. Patrizia Petrolini, who is here tonight in the audience, a fantastic French scientist who has uh, developed a, um, a machine that can detect one abnormal cell in 10 ml of blood. This rare cell uh, detection is an incredible advance. The idea is every patient who has pre-leukemia, we are trying to study their blood samples to see the appearance of the first cell in the blood without waiting for the bone marrow to be completely invaded by billions and billions of cells and, and then detecting it. I think it's very important for me to really emphasize the point that not only is it important to study human tissue, why aren't we saving human tissue for doing it? Why haven't uh, institutions invested in biobanking properly? I mean, I am, I have been saving these cells for the last 30 plus years, and um, th 60,000 samples from thousands of patients. Not a single cell is contributed by another physician. And the idea is that we now have the tissue to study. We have all the techniques developed. We need to just go and apply these measures. But where is the will? Where are the resources? So the idea is if we set a new goal, that the goal is no longer trying to develop drugs that have a 95% failure rate, but the goal is to try and develop new technology to detect the first cell. And if we financially incentivize this goal, then everybody will want to do that. Why aren't we doing this? And this is the main reason for me to really be forced to, I mean, I've been saying these things for 30 years, giving grand rounds, giving dinner lectures, giving breakfast talks, giving tumor boards, uh, appearing in, uh, on, te on uh, radio, on television, in podcasts. Everybody listens to me, they agree with me, then they go home and do the same thing. <laughs> so the book is just one more weapon in my assault on the field. <laughs> that at least if you learn about the granularity of human agony and anguish that we are putting patients and their families through, maybe you'll be shaken into doing something different. So if you beware of Azra, you should really beware of a weaponized Azra. Uh. <laughs> we'll just end with this. Thank you so much.